What's up, everybody? I am Charlie Marlowe. That is the great Brendan Schaefer. This is Low Hanging Fruit episode. I'm not sure which episode, but we're going to call it the home opener episode because, Brendan, both you and I were down there all day long, really soaking in <laughs> no, soaking in the home opener, right? Well, okay, so I know you did radio. You did Hot Take Central in the morning down there. I know that. And I know you were at Bush Stadium at some point because you snapped a photo from seemingly kind of upper deck near the press box, perhaps. Maybe you hung out a little bit up there. I didn't see you the whole day. So I don't know if we just didn't cross paths and you were working diligently throughout the, the afternoon hours. Um, but I did see your picture. Look nice. That's good. Yeah. So uh, I thought the game was at 11 a.m. I wasn't okay. sure. I Easy got there. Mistake. I'm like, wow. It's after three o'clock. No. So no one cares about this, but I'll just so we'll lead with it. I'll explain real quick. <laughs> this was about a, a family business decision of me making my wife's life easier because we had a lot going on after school with the kids, multiple swim lessons at different times. And the big part of this is, and you know, this as a married man, mm -hmm. and now you have a kid. I do have anybody a watching who's married. So sometimes to get other things down the road, you have to make sacrifices. Now I'm leaving town for the better part of four days to go to opening day Cleveland Indians slash guardians on Monday, because one of my very best friends is the assistant hitting coach. It's his first home opener. We have about 15 dudes from Bradley going. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be about four days. So I'm making my wife's life difficult monday and tuesday already and i'm like right. can i make it difficult thursday monday and tuesday that was my decision and that as a family man is probably the right call however if i get the chance to chirp you for it on the radio you are sure that i'm going to take advantage of that opportunity just uh, just so we're clear this is hot take central the the show that's obsessed with me and, and i'm i'm the entire show even when i'm gone <laughs> I tell, I feel like this is almost like an offshoot of the show now because you and I are on Hot Take Central on 590 The Fan at different times. We never interact on that. So I go and I bring you up and I'll chirp. I'll, I'll air my grievances, as the cat would say. And then we join each other on this show. And it's like it never even happened if I didn't tell you about it, which is why I do tell you. So it's not like I'm doing it behind your back. But yeah, they do. They love themselves from Charlie. I think they miss you when you're gone is what it is. Well, if only I missed them, you know, wow. I guess that's what it comes down to. No. Okay. Let's start. We're going to go backwards because I think this, this show, especially with the Cardinals off day, hopefully people will be able to listen for the next, you know, couple days. To me, this is the, the first week recap of the Cardinals, but we're going to go backwards. And again, okay. because you were there, I wasn't paint the folks a picture of the Cardinals home opener, baby. Well, it was cold. Um, I like how the Cardinals often, it seems like they're usually on the road to begin the year with the thought process being, yeah, St. Louis weather, late March, early April, can't really predict. Let's delay the opener another week so we can get better weather. That didn't happen at all. The day they played the Dodgers on the previous Thursday was super nice in St. Louis. And then it was like, you know, 50. It didn't rain. It was just cloudy. It was like a little dreary. But hey, man, everybody was happy to be at that ballpark. Nobody was doing anything like leaving before the game began uh, outside of Charlie. Everybody was there and having a good time. And the fact that the Cardinals win the game obviously makes it a lot better. But it was very weird because a lot of a lot of times opening day, the home opener, it's just like the pageantry and you can focus on just kind of tanking it all in. Pre-game, man, it was all about the injuries that were going on. And what the heck is this lineup? And who's going to be in the lineup? Who's available? And, oh, Matt Carpenter's on the IL. Like, Sonny Gray is talking about wanting to pitch in St. Louis and Moselak is going, yeah, maybe not. Like there was a lot of weird stuff going on. So you had the usual, just the pageantry of enjoying the opening day festivities, the Clydesdales, all that good stuff. And then in the, the background, you kind of had, there's kind of a lot going on this morning for this Cardinal team, uh, but they get the win, which is the, the most important thing. Fans are going to have a good time no matter what for the home opener. But the fact that you come away with the dub, I think made people feel really good about it. Despite, uh, you know, I was, I was a little bit, feeling the cold weather, kind of complaining. We like to complain about stuff. So I did a bit. I, I did my part with that. But no, it was a good time, man. Okay, so let's uh, let's start with the drama. You know, okay. hey, the people love the drama too. It's not just us. <laughs> so John Mosellock 
getting booed. Okay. And you were there. Yeah. So so tell me what was what was it like in terms of a degree of of booness, if that's a, a phrase. But also I'm curious, was Bill DeWitt Jr. booed? Because I always tie them together. And I think sometimes the fans they always rip on Mosaic sometimes when when Half of that criticism, I think, should go to Bill DeWitt Jr. Now, if you're talking about baseball decisions, we can get into them and we can fairly criticize John Mosaloc. But I'm asking you, was only Mosaloc booed? Because I would think if you're going to boo Mosaloc, you should also, and I'm not even for boos, but if you're going to boo John Mosaloc, wouldn't you also boo Bill DeWitt Jr.? Or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, here was my perception of this. If somebody was there that was more astute than me, and I'm getting it wrong, you can let us know in the comments. That's a possibility. But as I perceived it, it was, you know, they're all making their way around the field, the trucks and everything, and guys are coming out. There was a moment where Mo was pretty prominently shown on the Jumbotron, like the big screen, and I think that's when the boos came. The boos indeed occurred. If you recall at the end of last year when Wayno had his whole Wayno party, Mo got a, a few boos here and there, and I think he even kind of made some tongue-in-cheek reference to it and said, oh, I thought you were saying Newt, and it was kind of funny. Everybody, I thought it was funny. People that were booing Mo didn't think it was funny because they said, no, like let that. me boo you. You can't have a, a sense of humor about this. The boos were louder yesterday to my ear than at the end of last year, which is a little bit interesting because the guy said he was going to go out and get three starters, and then he did that, and... I, it's it's interesting. We could go for hours about just sort of the the temperature of Cardinal Nation on John Mosaloc and all he's done versus, you know, what have you done for me lately sort of thing. But the booze definitely happened. But as it pertains to BDW, Bill DeWitt Jr., I don't really think it happened because I don't think they showed him as prominently as long, which maybe was a strategic choice because, you know, if Mo is getting booed, you're probably not going to show the owner next and let him get some. You're probably just going to say, meh. We don't need to put him on the screen as prominently as we kind of aired Mo out a little bit, which I think you you kind of show Mo because he's out there. He's the known figurehead, and that led to maybe the opportunity for fans to to voice their displeasure with the way things have been going on. Uh, but I guess after that, they maybe to my eye, the reason that you didn't maybe hear it for ownership as well. I don't know if he was as there wasn't like put this guy on the pedestal and let him have it. They sort of did that with Mo for a couple seconds on the screen. Okay, so, and we're going to get into the baseball stuff, but I find this interesting because I just think there's this this ball or aura of negativity around this team and fan base, fan base more so. And I'd like to get your take on this. And I'm a person, I always say, you can't read too much into Twitter and Twitter comments and the people that really get negative on Twitter and also here on YouTube. I go through and I try to read almost every comment. I mean, I try, I can't, but I'll go through, I'll like them, I'll heart them, I'll, I'll reply if I can. And I I understand last year sucked. But man, from, from day one of last week, I'm talking about fans were bitching and saying the season was over in the first inning of the Dodgers game, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like there are some people that want this team to fail because they think John Mosaloc didn't do enough, which I think is, is fair. I've said 5 million times. They should have got another top end starter to go with Sonny Gray. They didn't, it is what it is, but man, do you think it's different this year? And I understand last year sucked, but man, the negativity I see from Cardinal nation on social media, which again, you shouldn't read everything into it, but to me, it's worse than ever by far. And it's also, it's also too early and it's irrational. I understand if the Cardinals started 10 and 20, I get it. This was starting when the Dodgers took their first lead last week. Yeah, I think, I think irrational is the right word. And we're not trying to rip our audience here because we get that a lot of y'all are on social media. Well, Charlie is, he doesn't like Cardinal fans. Me, I love that man of the people. I got to flip the roles. Yeah, that's true. I do have a kind of a red underneath. Anyway, it's more pink. Um, I think the irrational is right, but the reasoning behind it is understandable because for a lot of fans, they view it as an extension of last year because we're still in the the throes of like, well, they lost a bunch of games and then they didn't go out and have the off season that I thought they should have had because most Cardinal fans, I do think agree with you, Sonny Gray, they like Lynn or Gibson, they like, but they wanted to see maybe instead of one or the other, 
who are maybe viewed as like number four starter type guys, they wanted to see another upside play. And I think that's a pretty common view. And so when it doesn't go that way, and then when you have all the injuries in spring and you have, I think, this perception of messaging being kind of problematic for the organization, they don't always tell the story in the minds of the fans. And sometimes stuff gets misconstrued and it's maybe nobody's fault. But other times, I think they could be more effective in the way they portray things. When all of that is added up, and the Dodgers, that's such an example of a team that's willing to spend. Look at them go, the big old payroll, and you lose to them. That just has people grumpy. I don't think, though, and I know you do a politics channel as well, Charlie. Like, I don't think this is exclusive to, like, sports fans or Cardinals fans. I think people just, you know, the more you spend on so social media, the more you have the capacity for hate in your heart. <laughs> and it, it poisons all of us. And so I feel like, yes, it's all kind of coming to a head. In a time where we just all want to vent about stuff going on on social, the Cardinals happen to suck. And so it's not a it's it's not really lovely timing if you're John Mozeliak trying to put the rubber stamp on that legacy in your final couple of seasons. I do think it's irrational, though, because if you were to take just 2024 at its face value, Cardinals are four and four. They've done some nice things. They've gotten off to a slow start in some other areas, but it's like they're right in the mix in terms of just being competitive in the first week and a half or so. But I think people still have last year in their minds, and that's what they're that's what they're booing for. That's what they're upset about. But it is interesting to see it at the stadium and not just on Twitter or YouTube comments. Like not everybody that went to Bush yesterday is on Twitter or YouTube, but a number of them were still probably voicing their displeasure with the org. And you said I won't read the the full quote, but it goes back to uh, the Dave Chappelle skit. If you have hate in your heart, let it out. And by the way, and I won't finish that. That's that okay. Whole that's good quote. Because that's not that's not good. But it was not a scam kind of show, right? But my point is, and you brought up the political channel. Yeah, the the political comments are are way worse, and clearly way more partisan. <laughs> yeah, right. But that's different because in politics, most people, especially that comment, have their team, their team red or their team blue. Sure. You would think you would think most Cardinals fans are on the same team, which team is red. the St. Louis Cardinals team. Yeah. The reason I, I bring it up is I, I almost feel like I almost feel like weirdly there's a there's a, a sect of this fan base that wants the Cardinals to fail to prove that they're that smart ownership and Mosaic aren't doing enough. And now yeah. it only might be five percent and it's allowed five percent, but I think that's true. I think there's something to that. Like the segments that it splits into is the folks that their take, like once you have a take and you put it out there. And your 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 Twitter account or your YouTube comment history is like that's your personality and that's what you've put yourself on the line to believe. When something backs that up that happens in a baseball game, you're like, see, I told you so. Versus if maybe they start winning, all your criticism looks a little bit empty. And so maybe I don't think again, I don't know that that's the bulk of people. And and again, we're understanding of Cardinals fans having passion because that's what makes Cardinal Nation what it is. That's why people like Charlie and me, I mean, Charlie's a big deal. He was on Fox too. He's a big deal. I'm a guy, you know, no TV, but people still will watch me talk about the Cardinals on YouTube because they love the Cardinals that much. It's not about me. And so that passion is really, what's going on? I mean, you work, you literally work for a TV station right now. Well, sure, but they, in the, they be, 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 begrudgingly, they'll put me on television occasionally. It's a mistake every time they do. But, you know, I'm writing stories and people want to read about the Cardinals, so they'll read that guy's story because it's about the Cardinals. My point is the passion of the fans is what makes it great, is what makes it a thing, and that's very important. But at the same time, I do think there can be, when when you have a bad season, you can see Cardinals fans kind of, you know, they're over it in a way, but they can't tune out. They can't just let it go. They have to say, look, let's talk to these people online that are going to at least read our comments because I don't think Mo's surfing Twitter to see what the Cardinals fans are thinking. So in a way, people like you and me a little bit, we're kind of like the conduit to some of those thoughts, which is fair. We do welcome that as much as we kind of chirp it sometimes and, and, you know, poke holes in some certain things. I think we do enjoy the, the, the banter and the idea that people can have their thoughts be known. Oh, I love the banter more than anything, by the way, it's fine. I will say, now, this was years ago. This was actually before John Mozeliak admitted this. Years ago, when I did work in TV at Fox 2, and we had all those Saturday games, and we had the red zone. Oh, that's if it was right. A, a, if it was a close game in terms of I could drive to, let's say, Cincinnati, Chicago, Milwaukee, I would usually drive up there for the, the live pregame show. And I remember being in Cincinnati once. This was over 10 years ago. 
and John Mozeliak saying he did have a burner to check out Twitter. And then he later, this might've been years later, he actually kind of admitted that. I feel like he hinted. So I think all of these, whether you're an executive, you're an owner, not maybe Bill DeWitt Jr. doesn't have a burner, but I think, I think he has somebody who lets people know what the fans are thinking. And I do think somebody like John Mozeliak or, or Gersh or whoever, they might have an anonymous Twitter account just to kind of see what's going on. Yeah, I don't think Gersh's is even that hard to figure out. But anyway, like I think oh, he, he has one. I think he does, but I have no idea. I I I believe that these guys have these, but like, is Mo checking it to see what every Cardinal fan is thinking, or is it just take a temperature? Is anybody is Charlie Marlowe spouting off, and I need to be like Charlie Marlowe, get it together, get a grip? You know, I don't know. I don't. I'm not Mo. I'm not in that front office, so I don't really know how that works out. But I don't because you brought me up. Even if I criticize the Cardinals. Oh, it wasn't about a, you. It was an example. I know, but I'm saying, what I'm saying, though, is that I, I, in my opinion, critique the Cardinals in the exact same way now as I did when I was down there a lot. You think? Which is because you just, you still run into these people. Yeah. Like, I'm, I am going to go to other games and actually stay for the game. I and know. I was just teasing I'm not, you. No, 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 I'm, I'm kidding. But what I'm saying, though, is like, I'm not. If I say John Mozeliak made a bad trade, right. I'll say it. If I say John Mozeliak made a bad signing, I'll say it. He's a big boy. He understands that. That's part yeah. of his job. You don't call these people a-holes and they're pieces of crap, and I'll never do that. Right. And there's more of that, obviously, on social media. I don't even know where I was going there. I don't um, know. I liked hearing so you here talk we go. about it, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. All yeah. right. So we're going to continue to go backwards. So, so far, so good Marlin series. By the way. We were joking yesterday on Hot Take Central. I said I thought the Cardinals might lose the opener. The only and I said they'll win the series. The only reason was because the Marlins hadn't won a game. Yeah. This is like a from a betting standpoint. I was like, man, the Marlins were 0 and 7. I feel like they got to win eventually. So hopefully now the Cardinals, you know, sweep the series, whatever. That's we'll like go the backwards. The roulette table though. It's got to come up red this time. It's been black 7 times in a row and then red again. But don't you think like that as a gambler sometimes? I I think that's called the gambler's fallacy. Actually, there's a <laughs> there's a word for that. But yeah, I mean it's it's kind of inherent to human nature a little bit. Okay. Um. All right. So Padres series. I'll just okay. throw it to you. You know, nice series. You get the series win. You had a chance to sweep. It starts out. Kyle Gibson deals. That was great to see. You know, and I'll, I'll throw it to you like this. Couple really good things early. Because guys that had crap camps that fairly you're wondering, man, what's up with Goldie? Man, Kyle Gibson. Both of them early on kind of shut everybody up, which I think was good to see. Yeah, Kyle Gibson was the standout performance from that first turn through the rotation. Seven innings, two runs. I also think there was an element, and he mentioned it after the game, of kind of pitching to the score, knowing the Cardinals had a really healthy lead, and so he gave up that second solo shot. But the whole point of that was, I know I need to get through seven for this team. I need to save the bullpen. That's the kind of pitcher, and I think you can, and I don't want to overplay, like, he's such a great teammate for, you know, sacrificing personal stats for the team. But I do think there's an element of, like, I wonder how much maybe that was going on with last year's Orioles team. When you think about, they just scored a bunch of runs, man. And you look up and go, wow, how did Kyle Gibson win 15, 16 games, whatever it was, and still have that 4.7 ERA? I think if you go back and look at some of those games, he might have been doing a little bit of, hey, we got a five-run lead. I'm going to feed the zone here, and if they get me you know, for a, for a home run on a solo shot, I'm going to maybe accept that because it's a means to an end to get through this game and, and save my team's bullpen, which like we talk about all the time and say that it matters, but like there's a guy doing it in actual practice in a game, seeing that put into action, and I think it's it's fair to give credit for that if that was was part of his strategy, which I guess the other side, Charlie, could be, guy gives up a cookie and you go, well, I was really pitching to the score there. So like you can be a skeptic on that if you want to be, but I tend to believe that that's something uh, strategically that he does, but good to see that. Good to see the offense kind of have a couple of games there where that Dodgers series, not too consistent. And then you see him in the Padres series score in a couple of those games, obviously not game three, but then again, yesterday they were able to do it against the Marlins in the opener. So I don't know. I think if you want to be hot takey after one series against the Dodgers, it's easy to do. But then you wait and have a little bit more of a sample size and you say, eh, some of these guys that I thought because of spring training or because of one series might not be good anymore. They have a good game and all of a sudden their season long numbers change because they've only played eight games. So I think there's been a little bit of that going on. 
and they're kind of rounded into form. I also like the way the bullpen is pitched. Honestly, outside of a you know a hiccup here or there in that that Dodgers series, they've been pretty solid, and, and guys have not been too overworked, even with some circumstances of starters not going as deep. You had a rain delay on Saturday, things like that. It's been pretty much, I think, the way you would draw it up for the bullpen so far, too, which is nice to see. Okay, and by the way, you mentioned at the top the injury discussion before the game yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I want you to let folks know what's going on there, and I'm going to tie it into – from the Padres series, what I love to see Wilson Contreras, um, you know, on base slugging. I know the batting average, I'm not a big batting average guy. Plus it's super early, but the two home runs where he's just seeing the ball, letting the ball travel and, and hitting homers to the deepest part of the ballpark early on in the season. And and by the way, I was never worried about Wilson Contreras's offense. Nobody was We're always kind of no. looking at what he's doing on the other side of the ball. But I thought early on, I think when you're hitting bombs, especially, you know, one of those pitches was kind of low and he's just hitting the ball where it's pitched with power. I think that's a good sign of a of a hitter locked in early when you're seeing him drive the ball like that to to center opposite field. So comment on that if you'd like and also Contreras injury and what else is going on with the injuries yesterday. Yeah, I mean, after the slow start for a couple of guys like Arnado's taking a little bit of time to get into it. When they were having Wilson bat third that day or two, I thought that's probably the guy you want taking as many at-bats as possible early in the game because of the way he's taken swings and seen it. Now, hopefully the hand issue doesn't impact him for too long. The way it broke down yesterday was that he did have an MRI, did some imaging. All he said after the game, it came back good, that there's no fracture or anything like that. But he got hit on the pitch or hit by the pitch on the back of that glove hand. And it swelled up on him and was, you know, maybe some discomfort. He would not have been available to play on Thursday. Cardinals are obviously off on Friday today as we record this. And then Saturday, you know, the hope might be that he could be ready to get back into the lineup. They did bring up Pedro Pajes as the third catcher because of the Matt Carpenter situation with the oblique. So he's on the IL. It made sense to bring up a catcher because you just don't know how long Wilson's going to be out. But yeah, man, the way he was hitting the ball, you hope the answer is not for long, even though we like what we see from Ivan Herrera had a good day offensively Thursday. Uh, Wilson is going to be one of the better hitters in this lineup, and he was showing that early on before the injury. Okay. And uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any other real real issues I had in that series, and I'll I'll let you weigh in. But the one thing that I think is is talkable and everybody was weighing in on social media, I'm not even sure I have a hot take on it, but I do think it's interesting, and that was the final game when – you go with the matchups and you pull Jordan Walker for Alec Burleson. Just how everybody knows, neither of them are really hitting. I mean, their their slash lines are almost identical. Walker's 167, 231, 208. Burleson, who had the great camp, remember, Burleson's 190, 227, 238. That's average on-base slug for folks there. That's the slash line. So I just looked at it like this. I understand. I'm not going crazy. It's, it's early on. You're playing matchups. I just think as, look, Alec Burleson, nice player. I don't know what he's going to be. Maybe he's a starter. Maybe he's a fourth outfielder. Maybe he plays for the Oakland slash Sacramento slash Las Vegas A's down the road. I have no idea. But the Cardinals are hoping that Jordan Walker is the face of their franchise. I'm okay with letting Jordan Walker hit there. And I get if that particular moment you're looking at matchups. I look at this more of just kind of instilling confidence in this guy for this year and his career, you're our guy, we're going to build around you, let's give you the shot. What do you think? I mean, it's a nice thought. And off offhand, I don't even remember specifically which game because we're kind of recapping a week at a time. I remember the moment, and I also seem to recall that day Walker just not taking great ABs. And so Correct. I could see a scenario where they look at that and say, all right, the idea of building confidence is valid. However, we're watching this guy play today, and he's probably going to go up there and strike out again. I, not that you're going to you know, dictate the outcome of an at-bat before it happens, but I think as the manager, you do have to play that game a little bit of like, what's a guy looking like today? How's he seeing the ball? How are his swings? How comfortable does he look in the box? And what is the repertoire of the pitcher coming in? Maybe we go go left on right with this thing and try and get a run late and see if we can't make something of this game. I didn't really have an issue with it. Like I get what's fun about baseball is we can like look back on every decision throughout a game, throughout a season. Eventually that gets a little bit exhausting. But that's kind of what we do, right? That's the name of the game. In that particular instance, I recall not having a problem with it. But if you want to hot take it, Charlie, you go right ahead. Let's go. Let's get fired up. 
Here's the finger. Remember the Here's finger? The finger. Yeah, I do. Yeah, finger bringing thing? that back. Okay, so, by the way, I really don't care. That was the only thing I brought up from the whole series. And I, I get it's a 50-50 call. But you you said something that I think is interesting. And, and here's where it gets to. Jordan Walker is a young player. We agree. He had a nice offensive first season last year. And, and everybody hopes he's really, really great. Now, you said that Ali looked at his ABs that game, which, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I was going to say Twitter, uh, YouTube folks, I think Walker was 0 for 3 with 2Ks in that game. I believe, it sounds right. I believe that's the case. But you and I, I think, would agree that if it was Nolan Arenado or Paul Goldschmidt, it no longer matters at all what they did in a game like that because of their degree of all-star, superstardom, potential Hall of Famer. Hey, I don't care if they went 0 for 4 or 3Ks. I'm not going to freaking substitute somebody else for Arenado or Goldschmidt. And Correct. just so everybody knows. I'm not in any way, shape, or form comparing right now Jordan Walker to those guys. I kind of find it interesting, though, like at, at what point can you no longer pinch pinch hit for Jordan Walker? I guess he has to have a really good year this year, for sure, at least. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, because of the name value of Jordan Walker, we know of him as the guy that last year, you're talking about him as a future face of the franchise. And so he does kind of come along with that cachet. And it would be a nice moment to maybe be able to build him some confidence if you had faith that he could come through in that spot. But I, I think the consistency of his approach is really what it boils down to. And that if he has a good year this year, maybe that demonstrates that he has sort of developed that consistent approach and you don't have to think about protecting him in that spot and maybe going with another guy off your bench instead of him. But maybe that is your answer. I think you answered it. A good year this year probably turns him into the type of player that you really don't have those sorts of thoughts He's kind of going through it a little bit right now offensively and, and beating the ball into the ground a, a bit and striking out. But, like, you could talk about anybody in this lineup, and if we wanted to poke holes in a guy for what he's done through eight games, we could. But I also look at it and say, hey, they're all kind of striking out. They're all having their moments where they don't look as as sharp. It's eight games in. I don't want to be beaten on Jordan Walker because of what's going on early. But I also can see it from the side of, of the Cardinals that said, hey, on that day, maybe Burleson takes a better A.B., the flip side is he didn't. I think Burley actually struck out in that at bat. So to your point, maybe if that's going to be the result anyway, you do try to write it out with Jordan Walker for as much as, you know, it's a minor thing. I could see your point of view on that. I don't have a strong take either. I do think it's interesting. I thought actually the more, if you wanted to kind of get hot takey with something, the notion of Mason Wynn sitting a couple of times within the first week. And in that last game, there was a play that Brandon Crawford didn't make. That probably, I'm not even going to say probably, it's almost certainly a double play ball if Mason wins out there um, just because of his improved range and sort of his willingness to to maybe make a, a more daring attempt at something versus Crawford just wasn't able to get to the baseball. And I'm not talking about the play where Crawford pocketed it in the ninth inning. Um, I guess that would have been the Dodgers game that they ended up winning and going to extras perhaps. That one I had no problem with. I think having anybody else in there and Mason Wynn tries to make a superb play and maybe it goes wrong on you and you lose the game. That's one thing. But the one in the finale against San Diego where it's like second inning, goodness, that's probably one that you, you want to see your shortstop get to. I thought maybe you'd have a hot take about that because I know some Cardinals fans were like, why is Mason Wynn, you know, sitting for the second time, even though Ollie Marmel had kind of said, hey, I'm going to get everybody mixed in. This is what you can expect. Um, people were still upset because, again, we do like to micromanage every decision that we don't get the chance to make because we're on the sideline. But that's that was one that I thought maybe you'd have a take on, but that you didn't go there, so that's okay. Well, no, no. First of all, I can have a take on anything. I know some you of can. this stuff. Some of this stuff, like here's what I'll say, big picture. I think sometimes, like for example, the Cardinals had a lot of time last year to rest a lot of guys. Guess what? It was the last two months of the season when they were <laughs> so freaking bad that that nothing mattered. I understand you don't want to grind away at dudes early on here. I mean, the season just started. Mason wins very young. I'll tell you what I would like to see more of, just in general. And and I understand that there's something to taking a dude off his feet for the whole day, giving somebody a full day off. But yeah. I'd like to see more of, hey, let's play our starters. Hopefully in some of these games, it's going to be 7-1 Cardinals in the seventh. That's when let, let's bring in the backups and a Herrera to catch here and there and a Crawford to play some short here and there in some of these games where it's already lopsided. I, I do think early on, you got to try to get wins when you can, but see now I'm going to kind of contradict myself. 
You because, love to do that, yeah. Well, no, because I don't really have a, a definitive hot take on a lot of these things. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you one, one thing I didn't like about the Dodgers series, and this is where I'll kind of contradict myself. You know, you probably lost game four against the Dodgers because you didn't have your bullpen guys, and you could make the argument that if you don't bring Geo in in game two when you're down five zip, you 100%. can use Geo in game four, and you split that series. Now, that being said, I don't think you should punt – punt game two of the year necessarily, but it is the Dodgers. They're really good. You're down five zip. Now, as I say that, remember last night against the Marlins, the Cardinals come back from it's two down and it's the Marlins. So it's different. Like we all know teams can come back. I'm just saying if this is going to be a year where we're already focused on usage of relievers and pitch counts and going deep in game two of the season, if we're already <laughs> focused on that, and by the way, here's the other part of this equation with Geo. Nobody except the Cardinals and the organization knew they were going to put Steven Matz on an 80 pitch limit. I don't know if that's a couple true. days. No, what, what they, do you mean? All spring they were talking about he's a little bit off the schedule, off the pace of the other starters. There's but a 80? Chance, uh that's fair. I didn't know what the arbitrary number would have been as far as a cap, but if you had asked me on March 1st is Steven Matz going to have a pitch count in his first start, I would have said yes if he even makes it on time cuz he was just but everybody does. Pace. Everybody yeah, I mean, has essentially a pitch count. No, but like in their first start. 100, you know, if if Lance Lynn didn't get a rain delay Saturday, he's throwing 105. Like it's a it's an option for him right out of the gate. For Matz specifically based on just the language the way they talked about his his process in spring. That part wasn't surprising to me, but that was that was a minor part of your thing. I'm sorry to interrupt because that okay. was not really your point. Well, it plays into my point, though. So what I'm saying, though, is Ali knew that he'd probably need at least an extra inning in game four versus the Dodgers based on knowing Steven Matz was going to be on whatever it was, 75, 80, 85 yeah. pitch limit. All I'm saying is. We were already criticizing Ali for bullpen management and usage, which I think is fair in the first two, three, four games of the season. So if we're going to do that and we're going to play the rest game and all that, I do think there are probably some times where you have to go, look, we're down five zip. Okay, maybe we can come back, but we're going to have to try to come back with our B relievers and save our A relievers for high leverage games where we have a lead or it's tied. Yep. Now, and your comment was, and it was a good one, where Thank you said, you. well, we're we're playing the Dodgers, it's 5 nothing, but we don't really want to punt on a game. What would that look like? If you were to punt on a game, which you're never going to say you're doing, but you framed it in a different way. Well, you use your B relievers in that situation. And I, I did one of the YouTube live streams. I have a YouTube channel, too. I know Charlie hogs all this content. He just steals it for himself, puts it on his channel. But uh, YouTube.com slash at bshafer12. Just put Brendan Schaefer and, and follow my channel too, like you do Charlie's. Uh, I did a whole like 100 minute live stream that night after John King gave up the home run, and people were upset that Ollie used John King. But if you go back and look, that's who was available for that spot against a lefty. But the reason that that's who was available was exactly as you said, game two, five nothing, you go Geo instead of what I would argue would have been the choice, Ryan Fernandez, who, as it turns out, Pitched really well in game three against San Diego, struck out three. And all he said yesterday, yeah, that was really good to see. Might use that guy a little bit more now that we have an idea for what he is. And it's a minor quibble. I think the thing that people get caught up every time we might offer a minor critique of something, maybe it's of the managerial decision. It's like, yep, all he stinks. He's the worst. No, I think you got to keep everything contextualized. I think he made a mistake in not using Ryan Fernandez in game two. Because then you burn Geo, you also burn JoJo at that point, which might have been the lefty you could have used in that game, um, in that game four against the Dodgers, I believe it was that we're talking about. But you had used JoJo the prior two nights, you had used Geo the prior two nights. So you burned most of the guys that you would have wanted to use in that spot, and you didn't really know what to make of Ryan Fernandez up until Wednesday of this week because there wasn't a real obvious spot to pitch him, and you had to eventually just get him out there and see what it looked like. So I do think that was kind of what set up the the faux pas on Sunday where everybody's going, John King, really? But you had Riley O'Brien get hurt. You weren't hoping to have that happen. You used up the other guys that you would have thought for leverage in that moment. I get they wanted to get Gio a touch. That's what they said. Get him a touch in game two of the season. But 5 nothing against the Dodgers, you might know that his inning that he could pitch later on that week could be valuable if you don't use him in game two. So I was right there with you on that. 
But no, I don't believe that Ollie's a terrible manager because he made one dis- decision that I disagree with. I know I always have to kind of double back on that, but that's that's kind of how I view that playing out. But you should. We do, we don't do the straw man here on this podcast. We, how is we it can straw also, man? What do you mean? How do you how do you mean? Well, no one was thinking that if you question anything Ollie says, the comments that you're worse. saying he's a terrible manager. And by no, the way, I, I'll use a I'll use a poker analogy because I used to love to play poker. This is like the this is like the the pocket pair versus the two over cards. If, if I have pocket sevens and you have ace king, whatever it is, it's essentially a coin flip, whatever that is. If it's 53, 47, if it's 55, 45, that's what I'm talking about. Even with the Jordan Walker, Alec Burleson, I understand that's a virtual coin flip. It could be 60, 40. It could be 55, 45. We're talking baseball. Same thing here with geo. I get it. I would go on the other side. I understand, you know, sometimes to bunt or not to bunt. It's 55-45, and the manager has to make a call. I've never said Ollie's a terrible manager. I think it's to be determined on if he's going to be a really good manager. That's why, you know, it's a different question. I wouldn't have given him the extension. I don't think he's earned it yet. But, hell, maybe he, maybe in my mind he will earn it halfway through the season and at the end of the season. I hope, I hope that's the case. What are you doing? Are you playing the drums? No, this is just my, like, yeah, I can't wait till he stops talking because I'm going to get him. No, not we'll really. We'll go. That's kind of my, that's kind of my finger point. No, the reason that I say that I almost like double back and say, look, doesn't mean all is terrible because you know, as well as I do that, even if we're not talking about something, all he did, the Cardinals could have won that day, eight to five, and there could have been nothing to snark about the manager. And they could say, they've got to fire Ollie. We all know he's not a real big league manager. Like those are what the comments are going to say. So rather than have me say something that is a little bit critical of the manager, and then somebody coming in and saying, see, Brendan agrees with us. Got to fire this dude. He doesn't know what he's doing. I always do double back because I don't want to be taken or misconstrued in a way that you go, yeah, he's on our Because I'm not. Like, I've been very open about that. I think Ollie is a good manager. I also think the extension was fine to do. It is. It's a little bit different, the timing of it. Like, if you were going to do it, maybe do it in November. But perhaps there were things that happened behind the scenes in the offseason that or it's just one of those deals where everybody likes Jupiter. And so it's a better place to sign a deal. I don't know, but that's, they did wait till a time that whether it's messaging or whether it's a completely innocent thing, I do think because of when they did it, it, the, the fan, it gives the fans a chance to get upset about something all over again. If they did it in November, people would have rioted. Maybe that's the reason they're like, we just have to wait <laughs> three months because we know we're doing this, but we, we just lost 91 games and we need to let him get it out of their system. And then we're going to drop it right before a new season where he can then go out and prove, Hey, he's a pretty good manager. Hey, this is a pretty good team. Maybe that was their thought. Or uh, Yachty didn't show up at all. Well, during spring well, training. I think, well, I think that's a fair component of this. And by the I way, I don't think it's nothing. Here, I don't, you don't think what? I don't think that it's nothing. Like I think the Yachty, don't yeah. overplay it, but I don't think it's like zero. I think it's like, okay. Right. Yeah. That's where I'm at. And here's my thing about Ali also. I do think with some people, and I I think you and I are very reasonable, and I do think most of the people watching and listening are very reasonable. And even the folks who are unreasonable, hey, it's fine. Like, this is your passion. Yeah. I want you to comment. We joke about it. It's all good. I think Ali's a very smart baseball man. He's also young, though. And I do think sometimes any type of criticism, like if I was Ali, I would also understand you understand your strengths and weaknesses. Ali might be a great leader of men, but if you're a young manager, there are always going to be people who think you're too young. If you never played in the big leagues, that's always going to be something you're going to have to break through. Same with Mike Schilt. I do think like we would be naive not to think that Ali in his first couple, three years of being a manager, he's going to make mistakes that he's not going to make in year 16, 17, 18, 19 as a manager. And I don't even want to go back and, and redo the, the Phillies playoff game, but you don't think Ollie's gonna gonna learn from his mistakes in the regular season and the playoffs? I would say the same thing about Tony LaRussa. You think Tony LaRussa wasn't a much better manager in 2011 than he was his first couple years with the White Sox, right? So like I'm okay with there are some mistakes that Ollie probably makes here even early on in, in year three that he won't make in year eight. We're allowed to talk about that. He can learn from some of this stuff too. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And what's funny too is sometimes what we might coin as a mistake is probably outcome based. It's based on the result of something going wrong. Whereas I think even behind the scenes that we may never get a full glimpse of, 
there will be decisions that are made that go right, but a young manager can learn actually that even though it worked out, I might do it this way next time because I, I saw the the glimpse of, of maybe why it wasn't the best process, or that can also happen in reverse. I think a big part of being a manager is being able to, when something does go wrong, but you're convicted in it having been the right process to not just allow yourself to just, you know, turn into a puddle as a result. And then you're indecisive. You second guess it the next time and so on. It was interesting yesterday morning in Ollie's office when he was talking to the writers was asked like, you know, the Hall of Famers are all here, Cardinal Hall of Famers. Have you had much of a chance before to sit down or just have conversations with guys like Whitey, guys like TLR? And Ollie said, I have had that opportunity and it's really valuable. And what comes from it the most is asking them about dealing with the bad times, not like, hey, how did how did it go when you won 100 games? Like anybody can win 100 games and they can probably figure out how to enjoy that or how to, you know, but when things weren't going so well, what did you do with this? How did you? And he and like, that's the kind of stuff that fans maybe don't always get a glimpse at. But I have a belief that Ali Marmel is attentive to those sorts of things and l continually trying to get better at them. And and, you know, anything that might be considered a weak spot, shore it up. And I think that's the kind of baseball person he is. It's the kind of man he is of like trying to be diligent and just getting better at his craft. So those are the kinds of things that I say when people, why do you say always a good manager? They lost 91 games. So like this works as an example. So I'm glad we kind of got a chance to have me share that because I do think it's a little bit relevant as we're talking about the things you may not see in the box score that I do think ultimately can benefit all down the road as a manager. Yeah. And this isn't just a baseball thing. What I'm saying, this is anybody watching in any vocation in your job. I mean, we would all be silly. I'm 41 years old. What are you about to be 30? About to be 30 in July. About to be 30. I mean, we would be stupid more so than we already are, maybe. But if I said that I knew as much about whether it was sports or broadcasting or radio or TV when I started in 2004 in the Upper Peninsula, I mean, 20 years, I haven't got better. I haven't learned from my mistakes. Yeah. Same with you, whatever, 10 years ago when you started, are you a, are you a, were you a better writer then? Were you a better thinker? Were you a better baseball man then? Of course not. And it's the exact same thing with Ollie. It's okay to say that in year nine. I hope, by the way, I hope Ollie's here 10 years from now, which means he'll have been a great manager and the Cardinals will have had some great seasons. But of course, 10 years from now, when he's got a little gray in his, in his beard there, he's going to know way more. He's going to have been through all the wars and the ups and downs. Of course, that's the case. It's, it's pretty obvious if you really just think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's naturally the progression that anybody would take in their career. But when we're so like locked in on the moment and everything feels like it's such a big thing because Cardinal baseball, you don't have losing seasons in St. Louis and they had one. And so now it's like everything's going to hit the fan if this happens again. I mean, people are raring to go for it to go wrong. I think kind of back to your earlier point, that's part of it is like they better not let this happen again because this organization's too important. The history of the Cardinals is too important to let it go down that road. And so that's why fans, I think, get really not only passionate, but almost defensive of the history of the organization. And it's like, hey, y'all better not forget that that's what we do here in St. Louis. I think there's a sense of pride in that. And it is a, it's a valuable thing. And that's, again, that's why Cardinal Nation is so unique in that regard, because people have that sort of passion. And does it play out in certain ways sometimes that, you know, Mo gets booed and he might feel a certain way about that. I'm yeah, but that's just it comes with the territory, and I think people understand that. Right, and and I'll admit now that I'm I'm harping too much on this, but I do think it's interesting baseball strategy. I said this the other day on the world renowned Hot Take Central. It's a great if show, you go back, especially on it Fridays. is, yeah, especially on Fridays. Right, if you go back and you look at you know, we watch the games, but you look at the box scores from the Dodgers series. <laughs> What? Why did you say? You're like, yeah, we kind of watch the games. It was like a like a throwaway, like, yeah, we watch it sort of, but not really. Is that? No, because it's hard for, for everyone to process. How did you use your pen for four games? Sometimes right. you have to go back and you have to look at why guys were in, in what mm -hmm. situations. And I do think it's an interesting dichotomy when you think of game one, because Tyler Glass now shoved, and obviously that was a lopsided game. But And you're a fantasy baseball guy, so you know about Ryan Yarbrough for years. He would be the bulk guy for the, the Rays, yeah. lefty. He would come in and throw four or five innings after the opener for the Rays. And I thought it was very interesting that in that game, they were able to bring in Yarbrough to get that old school save 
three innings. They win the game. They only use one guy. They can move on. And if we, we do this whole thing we're doing, which I think is fair, if you have A relievers and B relievers, the Dodgers were able to reset, reshuffle the deck, have their A relievers available for game two. And then if you're going to rest those guys, had their A relievers again when they needed them for the game four, right? Now, remember the, the game the Cardinals won. That was game three. Yeah. If we play this back to the whole Geo thing, it was because the Cardinals, let's be fair, didn't have their A relievers for game four. And that's that's just what I'm talking about. And this is where you can say you're being nitpicky, but every decision in every game, because we're so focused on bullpen usage and starter usage, the way you use or don't use your pen in one game is going to come back two days later, maybe, and affect how that other game is is played. Yeah, and you have to be willing to use everybody. That's kind of to the point of game two of the Dodgers series when they're down 5 nothing, and you make a comment, which is kind of the thought process maybe of the team. Well, we don't want to punt on this game, right? We want to put our best foot forward to potentially be able to come back. But there does have to be a line of realism. It's like, yeah, it's 5 nothing, which then they ended up giving up a homer. Like, Geo gave up a bomb, so now it's 6. But the Cardinals come back and score 3, which emboldens them to go, well, now let's use JoJo because we're kind of making our way back into this. And it's like if you had just let Ryan Fernandez throw a couple innings, you have all of those guys, and you you have them at your disposal to use as you please later on in the series, whereas it didn't go that way. And so you're backed up a little bit anyway. Saturday backs you up more because Lance Lynn would have kept going. He had 70 pitches after four, but you have the rain delay, and it was just long enough to where, it, you know, to them it didn't make sense to bring him back in, don't risk injury, whatever. I didn't have an issue with that. But that's another part of the ledger that hurts you when you maybe weren't as efficient with your bullpen as you could have been the prior day. Now you go into Sunday, it all would have still been okay, or pardon me, Saturday at this point, it all still would have been okay if Ryan Helsley doesn't give up the couple of runs in the ninth or whatever it was to tie that game. They then needed to use Geo in the 10th, which worked. They won the game, but that was Geo's second day. So, like, it's partially managed to these situations and try to predict what's going to happen. But then, you know, hopefully Helsley just gets you that save the first time and you don't go to the 10th inning where you burn Geo, and even then he would have been available on Sunday. So it was a number of things that happened, some of them self-inflicted, some of them mother nature, some of them at eh, your guy just didn't come through that he, that normally does in Ryan Helsley, and like those all combined to where you probably lose game four because of it against the Dodgers, and that's what's interesting. But it's important, I think, to contextualize all of the factors rather than, yeah, Ollie blew it. He's a dumb dumb. And so, like, that's why you say, well, it's my news show. People don't. I think people like this because I do think getting into the weeds on it is the way they have to think about it. That's how Ollie's thinking about it. That's how the staff is thinking about it. So it can be good to sort of balance that out and talk about it ourselves. I don't know. You're laughing at me. What is it? What do you got? Well, it gets finger. back to this is my thing with uh, Hot Take Central. And I know you don't mean to do this, but the straw man to me is like, when you're talking to me, you don't have to say, hey, Ollie's a dumb dumb. I, I've never called Ali a dum dum. I can say I agreed with that decision. I didn't. I understand, but I understand there's a lot of people online that call Ali a dum dum. That's what I'm talking to. I don't do the show for you. I do it for them. Okay. How about this? For all the dum dums out there, I'm talking to myself. I'm talking. Which there are many. <laughs> I consider myself a dum dum. Oh, for sure. Um, often. I'm I, okay. would, I would agree with that. Yes, you are. You are For me or you? Off. No, I was just agreeing with what you said. That's the polite thing to do, right? You that said you're dumb. Nice. I said, yeah. No, I said dumb, dumb. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's be positive, though, because, and I mean this. When I was on the radio show, uh, whenever the series ended, what, Monday, I was like, okay, they lost three or four. I hate to say it. I actually came out more positive, and I said before the series, I thought they were going to lose three or four. Here's yeah. why. You lose, you lose the first two. I was putting my kids to bed that night for game three. I come downstairs, game had already started. It was literally bases loaded, no outs yep. for Lance Lynn. And I go, shit. I go, here we go again. <laughs> Seriously. I'm yeah. like, this is a loss. I'm like, I this is laughing. a loss. I was, I, I didn't send a tweet because I'm like, what if he gets out of it? I don't want to look dumb. I don't want to look like a dumb dumb. But I was like laughing in my room. I was like, if this, if this blows up on him, people are going to be absolutely ravenous. And they would have been. But right. obviously what happened, happened. And so in my brain, when I see, okay, Dodgers, bases loaded, no outs, first inning, I'm like, this is our loss. 0-3. Yeah. Lance Lynn battles his ass off. He gets out of the jam. He gets out of multiple jams. 
You obviously have the rain delay, but he pitches well for those four innings. He would have went either five or six had it not been the the crazy rain situation, which never happens in L.A. You win that game. Yeah, you win that game. You probably should have won the series. You had a great chance to split with the big bad Dodgers on the road, a team that might win 100, 105 games. I came away from that actually more positive maybe than ever in a series that you you lose three out of four. And we said this a million times on this podcast. Just the fact that here we are now with an off day, the Cardinals are four and four. Everything's fine. We can forget about 71 and 91. You didn't start the year two and six. It's all good. You didn't dig yourselves a hole whatsoever. You now have a nice canvas to just do whatever you want. Go win 95, go win 90, go win 85. But you, you put yourself in a good spot to have a nice season and you are not digging out of a hole. And I think that was very, very important for this team. And if I wanted to be sarcastic after that rousing speech, I would ask you what place they're in in the central, but I'm not going to do that because you want to read the standings. Positive. No, hold on. I brought that up. I know that they are in last they're four and four and they're two and a half games behind Pittsburgh. So everybody, just so they know Pittsburgh yeah. six and one, as we record here on Friday, Milwaukee four and one reds, four and two. Cubs four and two, Cardinals four and four. Last, they play the some last games. place. Those teams should play some DM baseball games. What are you doing only playing six games so far? It's ridiculous. The Cardinals have played two extra games. Like, play some games, guys. Anyway, oh, they'll, catch, they'll catch up tonight because of the, the Cardinal off day on Friday, and I'm sure all those other teams will be in action. But, yeah, I don't care about the last place thing. I was just, you know, gently ribbing on that front. I do think they're in a great spot. And you mentioned coming out of that Dodgers series feeling positive. I think I had said the last time we recorded, or maybe it was another show, I predicted they would split. You said they would go one and three. And so, you know, I I was really close to being correct, but obviously things went the way that they went. But I would say you come out of that first series and like, what's the thing that everybody was talking about over the winter? Like, what's the starting pitching going to be? That's what sucked last year. Can it be better this year, even though maybe they didn't sign the guys I wanted them to sign? What's that going to look like? Through the first series, I think you thought, Actually, it kind of held its own. Michaelis isn't going to be as bad in other matchups that are more favorable to him. And then we saw that play out against San Diego. And then we hadn't seen Kyle Gibson. He's the only guy we didn't see in that first series. And he shoves to start. So, like, it even got more positive after that with him starting off the San Diego series the way that he did going seven and two. And by the way, the guy who's second in the Cy Young last year in the AL hasn't pitched for the team yet, but he's coming soon depending how soon might be a conversation between him and Mo, but it's going to be sooner rather than later the way things are sounding right now. Right. And as I'm looking at the stats, I agree, you know, Lynn really good. The first time, not so great. I'm not worried about Lance Lynn. You know, he has a 4.15 ERA. If he ends the season with a 4.15 ERA and a lot of innings and a lot of strikeouts, he's going to win a lot of games. People will take that. Michaelis, one bad one, one good one. Uh, so far, obviously, Kyle Gibson, great. And uh, Steven Matz, really good. So the one guy in the rotation that you're worried about is Thompson. But you just mentioned, hopefully, and I say this as no disrespect to Zach Thompson, but hopefully he won't be in the rotation very much longer because that second in the Cy Young guy will replace him. And then hopefully you can have a nice long bullpen piece. Maybe he's there, Ryan Yarbrough, to get back to the, the first part of this uh, discussion. Yeah, I could see that. I don't know what they would do with construction of the bullpen or if they'd rather leave Zach Thompson as a starter, which might mean AAA for him. And he would not. I mean, he deserves to be on the big club at this point. I would hate to see him go down, but they may like those are decisions. Can they reasonably keep him stretched out in the bullpen? And then if a starter goes down, he can slot right back in without needing to build back up. That's going to be maybe a question that you have to ask. Also, what's the role of the guy that would go to Memphis instead of Zach Thompson if he shifts to the bullpen? You have to figure out, are you covered with the, the roles in your bullpen the way you want to be if you did it that way? And the other thing about Thompson is like his velocity, man, like the numbers aren't terrible in terms of, look, he gave up three home runs in the first game and that's not what you want. Um, had some good things working other than that. And that's not to say that it means he pitched good. No, he gave up five runs. That sucks. But then the next game, five innings, three runs. I've used this line on a couple different shows, but I'm going to use it again because it's funny to me. Last year, if the Cardinals could get five innings, three runs out of their number five starter, they would have performed a ritual sacrifice of Fred Bird to do it. And so, like, that's what Zach Thompson just did. And we're talking about, yeah, he's not really cutting the mustard. 
I think the velocity is the reason because I think it's a little smoke and mirrorsy if he's going to keep going, you know, 91 and then he's throwing 88 in his final inning of work in that start on Wednesday. That would be kind of my concern. I hope there's no underlying thing going on. He said mechanics are a little bit out of sync. He's been working on that. But Zach Thompson's a guy that should be throwing, you know, mid 90s and kind of sitting 94 most of the time. So if he gets back to that, maybe it takes going to a bullpen role. I don't know. But even that, we could nitpick his outings and he's still been like, that's passable. Five and three. It's not amazing. The ERA is going to be a little bit, you know, but it's passable in terms of if he's your fifth starter. And like you said, he's kind of your sixth once Craig gets back. And uh, Kittridge so far. He's good, so man. good. Really like him. And I don't know what's going on with, with Keenan Middleton, how long yeah. he'll be out. But I was hoping that he would be a, a Kittridge type, maybe not as good. But again, you know, if, if you have – Geo being every year except for last year, Geo and yeah. Helsley and Kittridge. And if you get a Keenan Middleton back, you got a lot of firepower there. Yeah, that's even with Riley O'Brien down, which he may not be out for forever. I know anytime you hear like flexor tendon and stuff with the arms, you're like, yeah, he's he's toast. But they evidently, you know, they said they got decent encouraging news on him to where it's not like, hey, fire him up for surgery. So hopefully he can rehab and, and maybe get back sooner than later as well. And then, like, Libertor is a lefty out of that bullpen that I think could be interesting in in sort of this new role for him. Hopefully he embraces that and can become that kind of Andrew Miller type guy in relief. And JoJo, he was really good down the stretch for him last year and has been, you know, he's been fine so far to start this year. So I like what they have from the left side, too. And even Plante has been, I mean, last year he was kind of that throwaway reliever because he'd go for the ground ball, he'd get it. And then it would go through their bad defense and it looked like Polante was terrible. But like, I think he brings some utility to the bullpen as well and can also kind of fire it up there with the fastball at times. So I've been impressed by him too. All right, buddy. Well, you know, we're, we're pushing an hour here. That's kind of like all it. I got. It's kind of all I got. Anything else I always like to, I always like to say to the, uh, to the on the scene beat reporter, Stop. Brandon Chamber, who, games. well, no, I'm saying empty, empty your notebook. What haven't we touched on here? I, we didn't talk enough about the Sonny Gray thing. Do you think he should start in Memphis on Tuesday like Mosellock kind of told everybody that he should? Or do you think Sonny Gray, 1030 in the clubhouse yesterday, we say, hey, Sonny Gray, want to talk to us? And he goes, I really don't know what I'm supposed to say because he hadn't had that conversation after his sim game on Wednesday. He threw 54 pitches in Springfield, was supposed to be Memphis. They were going to rain out, so he goes to Springfield, throws against some double-A guys. Man, can you imagine if he was like yelling at those double A guys? I'm gonna throw you a slider, and he just like you know roughs them up. I would have loved to have been on the scene for that one. But he basically said, you know, next start probably 70, 75 pitches, five up downs. I'd like to go ahead and do that in St. Louis if I had my say. I would, I would just pitch here. Mo was kind of like, well, first he told the cat, and I don't know if Mo 100 knew like what Gray had said in the clubhouse because we go from Gray. Now we're going outside to talk to Mo. It's not that long after. The cat's talking to him for Bally and Mo kind of says, you know, Tuesday's the plan. And then he gets asked about it in the big writer's scrum with some TV there too. And I think it was actually Martin that asked the question maybe, but whoever it was, he's like, well, I've been asked about this a lot today. Uh, I thought the plan, I guess plans can change, but the plan was originally to have him throw in Memphis on Tuesday. So it's kind of like, I don't think it's like a, we can pretend this is a big fight going on. I just think they hadn't spoken because there was so much going on yesterday. So they hadn't all gotten to sit down and say, Hey, how you feeling? How's it going? What's it looking like? But gray is a competitor that wants to get out there. And, and it is a little bit of a nice thing that they would be at Bush still, if he gets to pitch on what April 9th or whatever it is, instead of pitching at Memphis versus starting on the road for your first game with the Cardinals. It kind of seemed like he wanted to pitch it in St. Louis, but I, I, what do you think should happen there? Do you trust Sonny Gray to say, look, he knows his body. If he's good, he's good. Or do you say, yeah, you kind of already did that 80 pitch calf thing with Steven Matz. We don't want to put the bullpen in a bad way. If that's what your, your starter is dealing with, let's get you one more. And then you could be fully ramped up by the time you join us. Where do you come down on that? Okay. So as you bring this up and I'm thinking through it, as you're, as you're talking, I, I find this fascinating for, for one reason. I'll get to that in a second. First of all, you know how this is. This was a day game on a Thursday. Yep. You got to see how his arm responds. You got to see how his body responds. So I'm not going to make a big deal of that. And I'm sure, okay, sometimes, hey, I want one more start in the minors. The organization says that. Hey, the, the player wants to go to the big leagues. I get that. Again, I'm not going to make a big deal. It's one of those 55-45 things. But I always think about how how every what's, – what's the – every every action has an equal and opposite reaction – 
as you were talking, every rose has its thorn, but yours is better. Also, yeah. also every rose has its thorn. But as you discussed that, the first thing I thought of was Jack Flaherty. Was it last yep. year or the year before? Remember when Jack wanted to pitch in the last big year. leagues last year? Probably or, wasn't ready. He kind of yeah. he kind of forced he 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 convinced Mosaic and the Cardinals to allow him to. It blew up in their face. So I think any type of history with things like this, good or bad, I'm just guessing in John Mosaloc's brain, that's probably up there somewhere thinking, uh, maybe one more start in the minors, especially since it's freaking early April right now. One more start in the minors ain't going to kill anybody. Yeah, and on Hot Take Central today, Cole was kind of trying to paint that picture of like, well, you know, he, they can't option him, so if he refuses, well, they were like, well, it's not really an option situation. But he, he had the point that, if the player with certain amount of service time or whatever doesn't want to do the rehab assignment, they can't force him. But I was trying to, I don't think that's a situation here. It was just, they hadn't talked about it yet. And Sonny was, he's a candid guy. So he said, yeah, this is what I kind of think I'd like to do, but we'll sit down with everybody and discuss it. We just haven't gotten a chance to do that yet. He sounded very amenable toward whatever the case was going to be, but he's also a, a candid kind of open guy with the way he's thoughtful about things. And so he wasn't going to lie and say, yeah, I mean, I'll just do whatever the team. Yeah, he'll probably do that. But you asked him what his, you know, what his preference. He's going to say, yeah, I think I'd like to pitch here in St. Louis. So, and I also think you could make the case is Sonny Gray the same, you know, whether it's level of established or level of trust factor or whatever. I'm not trying to paint Jack in a certain way, but like, is there a different relationship as it pertains to Sonny, given that he's new to the team, given that the Cardinals may just have to lean on his own knowledge of his body versus they kind of had their own built-in thoughts and expectations on Jack and what his history had been, et cetera. I don't know if that plays into it or not, or if we're kind of getting into the weeds, but I think it's interesting. I, the, the cat came down on it and said, yeah, they probably he's going to pitch in Memphis on Tuesday. If the cat had to guess, I think Sonny's amenable to that as well. Personally, I'd kind of like to see him pitch in St. Louis on that day. Cause it would be more fun, but I also can see both sides of it. Like you said, 55, 45. Yeah. I would like to see him pitch in St. Louis as well. And and just so everybody knows, I haven't even, you know this, I don't look at the schedule that many days or weeks Dude. in advance. I don't know. I don't know the off days next week. We will get on a, on a podcast schedule. I promise people, even though I'm going out of town. But the reason I bring it up is this. I haven't looked at the off days, but you know what can kill a team even early? What can kill a team is a bunch of four inning starts. Yep. And if you say Sonny Gray is going to do five up downs, okay, that's, you're hoping that he could get through 75 pitches in the big leagues. It's the big leagues, man, to quote the great, late, great Tim McCarver. That may turn into four innings, and you can't just you can have a lot of four-inning starts early on in, in the season. It crushes your bullpen. I'm, I'm with the organization. If, if they want Sonny to have a start in the minors and then let him throw 90 to 100 and be close in his first big league start, that's the way I would do it because it's early April. Now, if you ask me the same question – Hopefully, Sonny Gray is not being injured like in August. But if you ask me the same question in August and he's already pitched throughout the year, I'd probably say, no, nah, throw him out there in the big leagues. Right now, it's early, better safe than sorry. And it's also, if that is the Zach Thompson spot, it's also kind of one of those things where you go, eh, might like to see one more touch for him so we can look at like, all right, is he working on syncing up mechanics? Did he do so successfully or is that still a work in progress? to where we make a different decision about his next steps too, that could play into it as well. So yeah, I think there are some interesting angles on both sides of it. And, and, and you did a nice job there, Charlie, of kind of, kind of walking us through that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Even though I wasn't there at all and I didn't even stay for the game, but well, you, on that you note, took a picture though, it was a nice photo of Bush stadium completely empty. And that was the only time you saw it yesterday. Well, here's the thing. I wanted to make sure I went over there and grabbed my credential so that the beautiful St. Louis Cardinals know in the future when I want to go to a game every once in a while. You can trust. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like All that. right. Low hanging fruit episode, whatever the hell this is, 10, 11, 12. 10 I'm not 11. sure. Yeah. 11. That's fine. You mentioned you one doing? thing. I know I'm doing the finger point. Cause I'm like, I actually have one more thing. We always have one more thing. You mentioned the, the idea of not knowing the schedule or the off days and stuff which makes me laugh because, and this is bad, but like there'll be times I'm talking to my dad on the phone. I'm walking into the stadium. He goes, who's pitching today? I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm somebody I'm sure. <laughs> like, but do I know? Yeah. I go, no, nah, it's Lance Lynn. Like we, but sometimes that does happen where you're like, I'm not really locked in on. I'm thinking about a lot of different things. I don't remember who's pitching today. Might happen from time to time. That's all I'm saying. 
Okay, and I'll just say this. This is for everybody out there, okay? I am no longer an everyday sports reporter, okay? I don't work at Fox 2. Uh, Fox 2, I don't even work full-time at radio anymore, okay? What do you so do? I'm not. What? No, what I'm saying is, no, yeah, I'm kidding, ask kidding. me about NASCAR. I'll tell you about the freaking truck races and the Xfinity races. I cover That's a different NASCAR. video. That's a different channel. Okay. All I'm saying is I, I embrace now. I will admit to you that I don't know everything. I don't even know half of what I knew back when I was covering the team. But you know what? I'm going to still come on and talk about it. That's what we're doing on this show, okay? I don't know who they're playing. I think they're playing the Phillies next week because I have tickets to the game on Wednesday. That's a day game. I know the day games based on I want to go drink. I like drinking during the day games next Wednesday, Phillies Cardinals day game. I know that. You are me 15 years from now after I am burnt out on doing all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do what Charlie's doing. And then you'll be kind of older than that. So I have to check up with you in 15 years of like what you're doing. Are you still going to the day games on Wednesday? But nevertheless, uh, you know, and I don't know everything either. Like, I don't even like that. The cat puts me in that spot all the time on the show where he he'll be like, you know, you know, things cause you're the, I'm like, well, cat, I really try to get there as often as I can, but I do these other things. And so I don't want to portray that I'm at every single game or that I travel the road, which got a son at home. Sometimes I'm not, you know, I just want to, I get there and I know some stuff, but we'll be aware of what we know, what we don't know. And we'll give deference to the possibility that we might sometimes not have it a hundred percent. Right. But hopefully people enjoy us kind of walking through things, at least with the knowledge that we do have. But here's another thing, Brendan. Yeah, you know, you know baseball, okay? You know the game of baseball. Yeah, I covered hockey for twenty years. I don't know <laughs> shit Still? about hockey. <laughs> yes, yes, I was there for twenty years. I don't That's know shit about hockey. hockey. Yeah, a, there's a lot of. I can show you my text chain from all my college buddies. They all played Division One. They played in the pros. Their coaches, their their instructors. All due respect, they know a lot of baseball. They don't cover games. That's all I'm saying. They know a lot of baseball. I like it. Well all said. Right. Comment, like, subscribe, low-hanging fruit, maybe episode 11. We got to wrap it up. Brendan, great job, buddy. Follow b Shafe daily. Yeah, find fantasy that. football. Yeah, well, the, the fantasy stuff I'll start plugging in July when I start. I'm going to make like three videos a day and just hit people over the head with them until I get that that channel monetized. But don't worry about well, that on. yet. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're not, you're not to 1,000 subscribers yet, right? I am. It's like at 600 and I stopped making videos for, cause it's not, you know, fantasy football season right now. So it, it'll, it'll be a work in progress, but I do, I need to get that one to a thousand at some point. Well, I'm trying to help you right now because we want you monetized. Cause I, I like you. We want you monetized hey. by football season. Yep. So you're making money once it starts. So everybody watching right now, please go subscribe to Brendan's baseball channel, B shape daily, but also the fantasy football channel. Go there right now, please. And subscribe. What's it called? Brendan Schaefer, fantasy football. It couldn't be easier. There My you go. name All plus right. fantasy football. Good stuff, buddy. We'll see you next week. We'll do it. Like I said, I'll be in Cleveland for a couple of days. We'll do it either Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We'll get on more of a schedule. It'll we'll be great. It. You're we'll great. In August, we'll be like, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> Dude, I got kids, man. And I hey, got NASCAR. I got a son, Listen, all right? I got to be honest. My main job is NASCAR. NASCAR comes first. You know I love you. Oh, you Kenny, I second. said, hey, I haven't seen Kenny or talked to Kenny in so long, but I love Kenny. I will. I will. All right, guys. We will we'll finally end the show. Comment, like, subscribe, share the, the channel and the shows and the put on social media. Put it in your group text. There you go. Low-hanging fruit. Episode 11, we think. See ya.